Hey y'all, hey, it's your girl Morgan Renee. She's tuning in with you for another story time with more of mine. We're still in Trying to Sleep in the Bed You Made by Virginia D. Berry and Donna Grant. We're in chapter 10 now. I read chapter 9 yesterday at the beach and baby. Oh, I noticed a mosquito ain't getting here. Hold up. You got to die. I'm sorry. You cannot live. Mm -mm, I don't play that. That's why I got the nets up. Hold on, y'all, because I, 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 I can't play about the mosquitoes. I just can't do it. They're vile. Just like flies. Why? Why do y'all exist? God, I don't, I don't know about this creation. I don't, I don't know at all. I don't know a thing. All right, now, the rest of y'all, y'all see what happened to your two cousins. Don't, don't, don't make it a third. I just killed one right before I got on live. Anywho, chapter nine was super intense. Uh, Gail then ran off and got married to Randy, whose baby she pregnant with after she had been dating Marcus since they used. Um, he won some gambling. I think he got a gambling problem. I think that's going to um, take a nasty turn at the end of the, at the end of the book. And uh, she also found out that her parents ain't her parents. Real quick before I get into chapter 10, though, I want to go back and read, um, not chapter 1, but I think it was like the, the intro, because the prologue. Because it kind of, some things are starting to piece together now that I was confused about in the prologue. So I'm going to read the prologue and then I'm going to get into chapter 10. So the prologue said, what happened to my life? N 1989, Westchester, New York. This don't make no kind of sense. Gail plucked a wet towel from the bathroom doorknob and flung it toward the white terry cloth mound on the gold vein marble floor. This heifer just checked in last night and already used every towel in this place. She wipes her hand roughly against her thigh to dry it, then shudders, still feeling the unidentifiable orange scented goo she palmed while changing the sheets in the room next door. From the moment Gail entered this room and eyed the expensive clothes tossed on the bed spilling onto the floor, she knew this woman had money, or at least liked to look like she did. Some of those same pricey designer labels, uh, neatly arranged by color and style, used to hang her own walk-in closet. Hmm. At least they made it easy to organize them for the consignment shop. She stooped to retrieve a soggy washcloth wadded up in the middle of the tub and felt so tired she could have curled up on the hard, cold enamel and been asleep before her eyes closed. Snap out of it. She straightened up and went to the sink. Mocha makeup streaks stained the hand towels balled up next to the basin. So, it's a sister. Gail pitched the towels into the pile. It don't take long to become just like Miss Ann. I know her mom and her raised her to be this nasty. It reminded Gail of how her husband used to fuss when she dusted and kneaded up a, at home before the housekeeper came, but he didn't grow up listening to her mama go on about cleaning up behind filthy people. She had hated those stories and any other reminders her mother was a cleaning woman, but, but, but determined not to be the subject of similar tales, she always ignored his wise cracks and kept on dusting. When we stayed at hotels like this, I never left such a stop it gale just stop it that was another life and every day she's vowed to stop reliving it reliving him at least in the daytime the dreams were bad enough i gotta let him go gail spritzed the expensive mirror and vigorously polished erasing the hairspray cloud and toothpaste specks without once catching her own reflection she didn't need a mirror to tell her she looked like somebody sent for and couldn't come home as her daddy would have said it was the one good thing about this job as a part-time hotel maid, she didn't even have to pretend she cared how she looked. The shapeless gray and pink uniform hung like a potato sack, hiding her curves, but it was better this way. But it was better this way. At least most of the men who stayed one drink too long in the hotel lounge had stopped calling her girly and asking what she charged for extra room service. If I stopped caring how everything looked a long time ago, I wouldn't be in this sorry mess now. She picked up a still slick bar of hotel soap with the abandoned shower cap and threw them in the trash. The long, wavy brown hair Gail had pampered and glorified in all her life was carelessly twisted into a frizzy knot at the nape of her neck. For the first time in her life, Gail avoided mirrors. The, glow, the golden glow of her skin had siloed and sooty crescents had settled beneath the eyes he used to love to gaze into. I put the fire in your big brown eyes, he'd say, and I'll always keep it burning. But after he vanished, the flame dimmed and flickered and now it was ash cold. Gail held her breath and fought the tears that threatened every time she poured the pungent disinfectant into the toilet. I need this job. Vanessa and Mama need me to have this job. She switched her rag around the seat, folded the toilet paper edge into a perfect triangle, then poked her head into the bedroom and checked the clock. Only 10.30. Gail sank to her knees and scrubbed the toilet. Look to Lord, what happened to my life? Before she finished, she was startled by palsied rattling at the door. Shit, I hate these damn cards. Money. 
He asked if I wanted money. The woman's muffled voice quaked with rage. What the hell is wrong with a key? Is wrong with the key? The shaking intensified, punctuated by sharp kicks. What is wrong with this girl? Gail rose to open the door. What are you doing in here? What are you doing in here? I'm checking out. The woman snarled as she shot angrily through the doorway. Doesn't anybody in this damn hotel know what they're doing? Heat seared Gail's cheeks. To keep from saying what was on her mind, she looked down and felt in her apron pocket for the list of rooms to clean she was given when she started her shift. But when the woman flung her folio on the desk and sent a vase of roses crash to the floor, Gail nearly jumped out of her skin. Would you leave now? Oh my God, it can't be. Gail was dumbstruck, riveted in place. But that voice, it was clipped and commanding now. All traces of the down home draw long gone, but she could almost hear that rich alto singing from the back of the choir loft. Gail stared as the woman yanked open her suitcase, snatched clothes from the bed, and stuffed them into her black leather bag. She noted the woman's hair, styled in a sleek, sophisticated cap. No more nappy kitchen, much less those wiry picanany braids Mama used to frown at when we were kids. She's still on the round side, but a lot thinner than before. And that outfit will pay my rent for the next two months. It's been ten years at least. Are you deaf or just plain stupid? I said, get the hell out. The woman wheeled from the closet, clenching a red chiffron dress like she would rip it in two. Her eyes blazed right through Gail. It really is, Patricia. Gail looked dead in Pat's face, opened her mouth to speak, but clamped it shut again, silenced by the scalding stare. I have to say something. She tried to find words, but this time choked on the memory of their last stormy meeting and how shamefully she had treated Pat, her best friend, the closest single sister she ever had. Suddenly, Pat spun around and continued packing. Anger and embarrassment enveloped Gail in a hot, musty, airless haze. She backed slowly from the room, daring Pat to see her. A film of sweat coated her body and anger seeped through her uniform. Miss High and Mighty thinks she's too good to know me. Hmm. She lived in my house when her own mother wasn't on her. Gail pulled the door to, then sagged against the wall and shivered with a fevered chill. Her head in a daze, her heart in an uproar. Damn you, I hate you. Pat's anguish wall pierced the quiet. Gail was drawn toward the cry, reached for the knob, but she knew there was much more than the door still between them. Then a torrent of sobs from Pat's room flooded the impenetrable, carpeted silence of the hall. All the years we were together, everything that happened, I never heard Pat cry, not even that day. All right, so that was the prologue. I had to get caught up. Okay, okay, it's coming back to me now. So apparently things shift later on in this book. Chapter 10, let's get into it. Prologue, help me. Tell me, we remember some things. All right, I hope he makes you happy. I don't know who's going to be mad, or mama or daddy. The closer Gail got to her street, the jumpier she felt. After a week, her folks will be fuming, but they deserve to stew. They did keep something important from her. She knew it would be awkward at first. Her mother would hug her, then fuss about how much she worried. So would her father, but he fussed louder and longer. He was probably in a lousy mood anyway, since his new diet didn't include bacon and ice cream, but he'd be glad to see her. Gail had it all planned. She apologized for upsetting them, tell them she loved them and that she was glad they were her parents, her real parents. Then she showed them her rings. Loretta would kiss Ramsey and welcome him to the family, then try to feed him. Daddy would come around as soon as he see what a good provider Ramsey is. When you say their grandchild's on the way, they won't be mad. Ramsey parked in front of the house. He dreaded this in-law business. The sooner it was over, the better. You're right. Gail looked adoringly at Ramsey. My husband. She liked the way that sounded. Then she fluttered her fingers, admired her rings, and opened the car door. After a week in the wide open, blue-green of the tropics, the house looked dingy and the block seemed crowded and dirty. But Gail got a homesick pain when she realized she wouldn't live there anymore. She clutched Ramsey's arm and headed up the walk. Here goes. Gail turned the key in the lock. Mama? Daddy? Gail? Pat rushed to the door, a dish towel still in her hand. What's with you? You look like you had nails for breakfast. Gail laughed. Besides, I thought you were going back to Princeton. Where the hell have you been? I've been out of my mind trying to find you. Pat sounded both hurt and irate. Your mother's half crazy, praying you're alive. How could you just disappear? What were you thinking? I really did it this time, huh? Gail talked fast faster, trying to smooth Pat's ruffled feathers. But wait till I tell him I'm married. Pat, it was so romantic. I always thought you'd be standing next to me in my wedding, but this is kind of sudden. Oh, how could I be so rude? Patricia Reed, this is my husband, Ramsey Hillard. Pat's like my sister. Ramsey made a move toward Pat, who glared at him just long enough to make it clear she couldn't care less who he was. Gail, where's Mama and Daddy? Is all that stuff left from the party? The party that never was, I should say. 
She looked at the dining table laid end to end with casserole dishes, platters covered in tin foil, and cakes wrapped with wax paper. We'll really have a party when daddy's all better for their anniversary and our marriage, and Gail, shut up and stop flitting around like this is a game. Gail didn't know when she'd seen Pat so upset. All right, she said quietly. I'll go apologize. Are they in the basement or... You don't get it, do you? Pat looked at Gail with sad eyes, trying to tell her. Gail, your mother's upstairs lying down. Ramsey, I'll be right back. Gail started up the steps. If she couldn't get them at the same time, she wanted to tell her mother first so she'd help soften up her father. It's only 7 o'clock. What's she doing in bed? Where's daddy? Gail, your father, Uncle Joe... We buried him yesterday. <gasps> oh my God. Oh my God. This, I know this is fiction. <laughs> Not they bury him yesterday. Oh my God. She got... She he in the hospital, they getting their vows renewed. Him and his wife, her daddy and her mama, Joseph and Loretta, getting their vows renewed. He fall out on the daggone uh pulpit from a I guess a heart attack. Go to the hospital, tells her that you're not really my daughter. We found you wrapped up beside a trash can, but we love you like you our daughter. You always been our daughter, you our daughter. She goes home, gets upset, Ramsey pulls up after not speaking to her for a few days after she tells him she's pregnant. He only came by because he won gambling. He went to go gamble, talking about something. If I win, I'll marry you. If I don't, I'm going to shoot the breeze. So because he won, he come knocking on the door, find her. They go off, get married, go to the Bahamas for a week. She not calling, checking in, nothing, come home, and her daddy did. Jesus. Woo, Gail, your father, Uncle Joe, we buried him yesterday. Gail stopped mid-flight, instantly cold to the bone. No, uh-uh. She shook her head. He was going to be fine. Coming home in a few days. She turned to Pat, her eyes pleading for a different truth. Pat took Gail's hand and led her past Ramsey into the kitchen. He had a massive heart attack in the hospital early Wednesday morning. I called all over. I couldn't find you, Gail. They held hands tightly, like in kindergarten when they only had each other. I don't know what upset her more. Pat motioned upstairs. Uncle Joe, or you not being here? Daddy can't be. Gail stared off in the distance. She had imagined him holding her grandchild, looking silly in love. Mount Moriah was packed. Marcus and his parents even came. Pat knew it was mean, but even in her grief, she was so mad at Gail she didn't care. The starting first baseman was back in the Orioles lineup. Marcus was headed back to AAA. Pat hadn't seen the Carters in years. His father looked the same. His mother looked old, like she had like she could have been his grandmother. She stopped wondering and off, but she still wasn't over Freddie's death. Pat made a point of telling Marcus to keep in touch. Gail or no Gail, he was a friend. Oh, Lord, Daddy died, thinking I was mad at him. Pat, what am I going to do? Mama must hate me. Gail wanted to wail, but for the first time in her life, the tears wouldn't come. All the stupid things she had cried, all the stupid things she had cried her eyes out over, all the tears wasted on nonsense, and now, when she needed tears to water down the pain, there were none. Ramsey stood on the fringes of the conversation. He had expected flack from Joseph, but Ramsey figured he'd use sir a lot and ask his advice about buying a house, and that would pacify him. He wasn't worried about Loretta. She'd see the rocks on her baby's fingers and be relieved that Gail wouldn't have to work herself to death like she had. But this whole thing, but this was a whole other thing. He didn't know these people, and he was uneasy in the middle of their family tragedy. He had to go. Nightingale, your mama needs you. You ought to stay here spend some time with her. Right now, I'll just be in the way. Gail let go of Pat's hand, looked at him, and nodded weakly. She wanted him to help her, do this for her, but she knew she had to face this by herself. If there's nothing you need me to do, I'll go on. I gotta check on some things at the shop. Gail walked him to the door. He gave her a quick kiss. I'll call later on, and he was out the door. For Gail, climbing the stairs was like scaling Everest, but there would be no glory at the top. She peeked through the crack in the door to her parents' room. The light was out, and Loretta lay on her back, lay on her back, lay with her back to the door on Joseph's side of the mahogany double bed. Gail tiptoed in and watched her mother for a moment. As a little girl, she had run in here seeking comfort. She had sneaked in with Pat standing guard to find the Christmas present she was sure was hidden in the closet. Later, she had bubbled with excitement about her first boy-girl party, but this conversation would be different. She eased down on the bed beside her mother. Joseph, Loretta called out as she woke up. Mama, it's me. Gail bent over and reached to put her arms around her mother. 
Loretta sat straight up and slapped Gail as hard as she could. Gail's hand flew, flew to her cheek. Loretta had never laid a hand on her before. Gail wanted this, wanted this slap to, uh, wanted this slap to sing and burn. She deserved that, but instead she felt numb. Oh, Mama! Loretta grabbed her daughter and held her so tight that Gail could barely breathe, but she could. Okay, it said the phone had overheated again. Uh, all right, so let me back up. Excuse me. Loretta grasped her daughter and held her so tight that Gail could barely breathe, but she could squeeze back. They hugged and rocked in the dim light for a long time. Gail started to speak, but there was no excuse, no apology, and no undoing. They would live with it, but talking about it served no purpose. After a while, Loretta took Gail's hand and pulled back to look at her daughter, absently rubbing her thumb back and forth over Gail's fingers. So where's my new son? Gail explained where Ramsey was and where they had been, but she had sense enough to realize that all the little details she had been so thrilled about were best left for another time, if at all. Loretta nodded as she listened. Well, I guess life does go on. I hope he makes you happy. Your daddy and I were happy, you know, leastwise most of the time. Loretta smiled, swung her legs over the edge of the bed, and slipped on her house shoes. But the happiest he ever made me was the day he walked in the door with you, wrapped up in making shirt. Lord, I wanted you to be mine, and I wanted you to be happy all the time. I spoiled you so. Joseph was fussed. It was my fault that we never told you. It's okay, Mama. Mama, you know what you said about life going on? Well, uh, we're... I'm pregnant. You're gonna have a grandchild to spoil now. Loretta's eyes filled with tears. What would Joseph say? Hesitantly, she reached toward Gail's belly, toward a new life. Is this really my grandchild? Gail took her mother's hand and placed it over the spot where she imagined the baby was. Of course it's ours. She could hear Joseph clear as day. My, my, all this news. I'm going to make me some tea, but I'll bring you a cup, Mama. When Gail got to the kitchen, Pat was simmering and devouring a slab of pound cake. She had been ravenous since the day Joseph died. Friends and neighbors made sure there was plenty to choose from, but she never felt full. The past week had been hell. When Gail didn't come home, Pat dug around in her things and found Ramsey's card. After Pat did a lot of explaining, his secretary admitted he was off getting married, but she had no idea where. Pat put two and two together, which kept Loretta calm enough to see after her husband, but they noticed the police, but they notified the police just in case. The last time Pat had stopped by the hospital, Joseph looked chipper. He asked about Gail. They didn't tell him she was missing, just home upset. He seemed to take it in stride. Then he asked if the Mets and Orioles won and cracked Pat up when he said he was going to take up tennis for exercise so he could show off his legs. Pat left feeling confident he was better. The next morning, the phone call came. From one minute to the next, Pat had known if Loretta would recall something Joseph had said and dissolve, beg Jesus to watch over Gail, yell about her daughter being spoiled and selfish, or take the blame for not telling her the truth sooner. Every time the phone rang, Loretta jumped like she heard a shot, and when it didn't ring, she'd pick it up to check for a dial tone. So Pat coordinated the funeral, choking back the overwhelming sadness she felt every time she realized her Uncle Joe was gone. He had always been supportive, proud, and loving. Pat missed him terribly and was pricked more times than she cared to remember by the innocent and well-meaning for whom are you family was a routine question, not a deliberate reminder that she was not. The story that Gail had run off to get married and couldn't be found was too awful and juicy not to spread like a flash flood. But Uncle Macon, who came home every day, made sure that not one soul had the nerve to mention it to Loretta. Now she shows up with a stunt. Now she's so... Okay, wait a minute. What? The story that Gail had run off to get married and couldn't be found was too awful and juicy not to spread like a flash flood. But Uncle Macon, who came every day, made sure that not one soul had the nerve to mention it to Loretta. Now she shows up with a suntan wearing a damn jewelry store in her hand. Pat heard Ramsey's sorry ass goodbye and wondered what kind of husband would leave his pregnant bride when she just found out her father had died. What does Gail see in him? Pat guessed he was handsome, if you like that type, but, she, but he was too slick. She didn't have to get married just because she was pregnant. I would have helped her, but getting married is all she ever wanted. Uncle Joe was right. Gail thinks this is the breeze that'll take her where she wants to go. Mama wants some tea. Gail headed for the stove. Pat reached and turned the fire on under the kettle. I'll make it. Gail opened the cabinet for a cup and saucer. Yeah, well, I guess it's the least you could do. Pat could understand being angry with someone for giving you away, disowning you. She knew what that felt like, but she had been upset when she found out Ma Ray had deceived her. Uh, but Pat couldn't imagine ever acting as ungrateful and inconsiderate as Gail had. What's that supposed to mean? You don't think I would have eloped if I thought Daddy was, what, going to die? 
Gail, you were so pissed off, all you wanted to do was hurt them. You could have called, but you didn't. I can hear you now. It'll serve them right to worry about me. You didn't even consider the possibility your father might get worse. How can you say that? I know you didn't, Gail. All you could think about was you, as usual. I was wrong, I know that, and I'll never be able to make up for what I did. Gail's whole body trembled, and she felt sick to her stomach, but the tears wouldn't come. Mama knows how sorry I am. Tomorrow I'll get Ramsey to take me to the cemetery to see Daddy and all is forgiven. You know, sometimes when we were little, I'd be so jealous because you had parents that loved you so much. And your father, I remember at Freddie's funeral when Uncle Joe rocked you like a baby. I wanted somebody to hold me like that, like my Ray used to. Gail, I loved your father like he was my own. And you know he was, at least in every way that counted. You weren't here, and I did everything I could. Everything. I know you did, Pat, and I'm glad you were here for Mama and for Daddy. Mm-hmm. Look at this. Pat handed Gail the funeral program that was left wedged in the napkin holder. The photo on the front was the one Pat had taken of Joseph in his groom suit. Open it. Gail did as she was told. Right there. Read that. Joseph Saunders is survived by his devoted wife of 35 years, the former Loretta Howard, Gail said, and one loving daughter, Gail. Pat walked out the back door. Mm. She lit a cigarette and started walking. Her brain was stuck in the last week like a car in a ditch. Five steps down, seven out the gate. The harder she spun her wheels to get out, the deeper the ruts became, so she counted every step and sucked in smoke so she couldn't think of anything that hurt. 36 paces to the corner, red light. She stopped. A bus, grunting and passing exhaust gas, rumbled by leaving a ghostly gray funk hanging in the humid July air. She threw her cigarette in the gutter and held her breath. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, until the smoke cleared. The light changed and she continued counting and walking. A zombie out for an evening stroll. Three little brown stair step boys approached her, seriously involved in the contest to see who could suck his popsicle the loudest. The next one, the next one, the next one of you out here is going to bed as soon as we get home, the woman behind them warned. Ah, ma, they wailed in unison. Must be her children. I'm nobody's child. Nobody's child. Stop it. Pat reached started the count and walked until the bottoms of her feet burned against the rope soles of her espadrilles. She stopped, looked up, and realized she was standing across the intersection from the Easy Street Bar and Grill. Shit, what the hell am I doing here? She left the house with no place in mind, and this was the last place in the world she meant to end up, but she stared at the storefront with turrets painted on the stucco like somebody might actually mistake it for a castle. She probably doesn't even work here anymore. The idea that Vernon could still be slinging shots at the same gin joint seemed ridiculous, but where else would she be? dead for all i know pat crossed the street a poster in the corner of the window announced a boogie down summer sizzler and fashion extravaganza at st albans plaza she tried to peek inside but dusty blinds blocked her view i have nothing to say to her she swiped the beads of sweat from her forehead but i could use a damn drink and a seat she opened the door it was as hot inside as out jazzy organ music laced with bourbon and payday came from the jukebox to the right of the door pat saw her as soon as she walked in Verna was at the far end of the bar, refilling the display of pork rinds and Lance peanuts. She looked up when she heard the bar stool scrape the floor and Pat, as Pat sat down. Be right with you, honey. She shouted over the music and wolf tickets being bought and sold by the glass pool. Pat watched her in the mirror behind the bar, collecting empty glasses and tips, wiping up spills, tucking the towel back in the waist of her black apron. <coughs> Verna didn't look as bad as she had six years ago, the last time Pat had seen her. She wore too much iridescent eyeshadow, false lashes, frosted lipstick and a messy and a mess of curly fake hair she looks like a reject from the supreme pat had no expectations when she walked in she thought about her mother once in a while but verna had become like one of those books you start a few times because you think you should but the story never grabs you you don't care how it ends and then you realize you just don't like it it's hot as hell verna blew into the low neckline of her green tank top air conditioners busted but ain't nothing stops them she nodded toward the noisy crowd pat hesitated vodka and tonic you got it she poured a shot, added the mixture. Lime? Verna looked at her customer closely for the first time, squinting, frowning. Pat? Yep. Why does she always look at me like she got a bad taste in her mouth? You old enough to be pretty much any place I choose. And yeah, I like lime. Verna added the wedge, took a napkin from a stack of fan, took a napkin from a stack, fan in a spiral, and set the drink in front of Pat. I guess that's right. You must be what, 20, 21? She acts like she wasn't there. She acts like she wasn't there. Pat took a sip. Is there some place we can talk? 
The only way to start a conversation was straight, no chaser. You wouldn't tell me anything the last time I asked, but I need to know about my father. Vernon emptied an ashtray. If you're old enough to buy a drink, I guess you can hear this. She pulled herself a Johnny Red knee and called to the waitress who was fanning herself with a Valentine tray. Lily, watch the bar for me. I gotta take care of something. Verna led Pat to a booth in the back. She took a gulp of her drink and fished in her pocket for cigarettes. It was summertime. It was summertime. I was 19. He was 23. Came to North Carolina to register voters. Mississippi is what most folks heard about, but voting fever was all over the South. They was concentrating on all the little jackleg towns and Swan City was one of them. She peeled the cellophane from the fresh pack, tore an opening in the bottom corner, and tapped one out. I had a job at dry cleaners in town, ironing shirts. I used to catch a ride with little daddy in the morning, but I walked home every night. She lit up, took a slow, a long, slow drag. Turner, his name was Turner, drove the same road I walked just about every day, and he stopped to offer me a ride. Asked three times before I said yes. When Pat lit her own cigarette, Verna raised her eyebrow but said nothing. Pat scrutinized Verna's features. Beyond the wig and heavy makeup, looking for a resemblance, something that might connect her to this woman. He was good looking, wore a tie every day, and the whitest shirts I ever saw, always with cuff links, not them big flashy ones, though these were refined. His initials in 14 karat gold. He was smart and talked all proper, told me he just finished law school. Shit, I thought he knew more than all my teachers put together, but he said it wasn't nothing. His whole family had been to college, even his grandparents. They were all doctors and lawyers, high muck de mucks in Virginia. Verna looked past Pat like she was reading words written in the air. He didn't act stuck up, but Ma Ray told me not to mess with him because he didn't want one, but one thing from a girl like me. I wasn't never pretty, but boys had been sniffing around because I had a big butt and big titties, well-developed as they used to say. She took a swallow of scotch. Ma Ray always did read people 